All right, hi class, welcome back. Now, in my introduction video to this week, uh, I made mention about how sometimes the events of the past have real life repercussions for the future. Um, that it's so easy sometimes to, to, to study these as something, uh, as relics of the past. Oh, that happened a long time ago. It doesn't really matter today. Um, what I want to talk about in this video. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why the policies and the institutionalized racism of the 1940s and 50s still plays a harboring effect upon the lives of many people today. And while many people will argue that we live in a post-racist America, they'll point to the election of Barack Obama in 2008 and say, ha, ah, see, uh, we are a post-racist country. Um, I want to complicate that by, by looking at some, some examples. So the first thing I want to do is, is, is look at this graph. This is in 2013. Uh, it was a study done by the Pew Research Organization. It's a nonpartisan group who are simply compiling numbers, attitudes, and behaviors. And in 2013, uh, in this study, they were looking specifically at the net worth of groups of Americans based off of race, ethnicity. And what they found, I felt, was very alarming. Um, what we have over here in this left graph, let me see if I can enlarge this. All right. I know that's not super big, but hopefully that's large enough for you to see. I'll try to make sense of it. All right, so what we have, um, does it show up? It does not. Okay. Um, what we have here are two graphs. Uh, on the left side, yes, on the left side, uh, we have a scale from 1,000 to a million, and that is the, um, the net worth. So what that, what that doesn't mean is salary. This isn't a question of how much do people make, this is a question of net worth. And net worth is a reflection of many things. It is a reflection of cash on hand, uh, it's a reflection of property, so homes, it's a, a reflection of cars that are owned, not leased. Uh, it includes things like retirement accounts, so 401ks, IRAs, 503bs, um, SEP IRAs. Right, so this is a uh, this gives us a picture of how different races or what their net worths are and how those have changed since 1983 through 2013. So this is important because we can see changes. We can see who, which, which races are enjoying the greatest. Uh, economic boosts uh, in terms of pay, but also in terms of opportunity. So on the left, we see white versus black, and on the right, we see white versus brown or Hispanic. So as of 2013, the average or median net worth of households in 2013 dollars for white Americans was $141,900. The, the median net worth of households in black families was $11,000. My question is, how do we explain this disparity? Now clearly, not all white have uh, in, uh, have net worths of 141900 I know I certainly don't. Um, and I'm sure many black families have net worths that are well above 11000 But again, this is the median net worth of households. How do we explain that discrepancy? If we look to the right column, again, we see the white number represented there, 141900 and we see that that number is 10 times greater than the median net worth of households uh, for Hispanics, which is 13,700. Now some people might rightfully say, well, that number reflects illegal immigrants uh, or first generation immigrants, people who just arrived in this country, who maybe have come with only the clothes on their back, right, but who are trying to get a start and they are first generations uh, they will be poor, but the second generation hopefully will have a better life than the first, and the third generation will hopefully have a much better um, um, 
much better income, much better op more, more opportunities. Um, right, so maybe that's how groups would justify this disparity between numbers. But how do we, uh, how, how do we argue um, about the disparity between white and black in America in 2013? 13 times greater. Now some may say, well, this is a reflection of choice. All right, this is a reflection of poor choice. A uh, reflection of perhaps having children out of wedlock, uh, dropping out of school. Uh, perhaps as a reflection of, of crime or drug use. Uh, right, so there's this, this group of people who will project that this, this discrepancy is, is a, a, a result of choices. But I want to complicate that by looking at the historical data. Um, in 2000 and, let's see here of this, 2014, uh, a journalist for the Atlantic wrote a very long but very well received article called The Case for Reparations. Reparations is essentially a fancy word for payback. Um, if I were to steal something from a, from a store, I would make reparations by giving the product back and probably paying a, a penalty on top of that um, in order to pay for the damages that I caused. Uh, so reparations is a way for a person essentially to, to, to seek forgiveness and to make the wrongs right again. And ta Coates is arguing in this article that after hundreds of years of slavery, after decades of Jim Crow laws, uh, after institutionalized racism, which uh, disadvantaged uh, people of color, that our country owes it to uh, the descendants of these families uh, reparations. Which, which means, this argument is that today, America should make payments to the descendants of, uh, of slaves, uh, to people who were discriminated against during the Jim Crow years, to those people during uh, the post-World War II boom years, those people who were not permitted to get FHA loans or because of redlining or were unable to move out of inner cities and into suburbia. The argument is that those things have lasting financial economic disadvantages to people of color, specifically to the African American community. What, what Ta-Nehisi Coates is arguing is that because of those things, we have this disparity between whites and blacks in America, and that economic disparity plays out in other ways, right? in other specific ways, uh, in terms of crime and, uh, and access to opportunity, um, uh, access to education, and yes, income. So I want you to think about this. I, what I want to do, since we've already covered slavery in this class, and we've already talked about Jim Crow laws, I just want to share a little bit about what ta Coates writes, and, and, and that is about the idea of redlining. Uh, in the post-World War II years, uh, the federal government, the Federal Housing Authority, and then because, the, because of the Federal Housing Authority, um, other private lenders systematically segregated black communities and refused to give them the same type of funding or loans as they would to people living in other areas. Now the immediate impact of that was that people, that African Americans who were living in predominantly African American communities could not get funding for things like home improvement, um, could not get loans from banks in order to move out of their homes, uh, and as a result, this community was forced to continue to live largely in these highly segregated uh, inner city areas. Meanwhile, white America largely flocked away from these, uh, from these inner cities and instead moved to the outskirts, to the neighborhoods, to suburbia. It is in these areas that the new homes are being built after World War II. These were new homes and therefore had higher property values. Uh, and these are areas that, whose property values continue to increase in the years thereafter. Now, this really struck home to me because two years ago, my grandmother died. Now, my grandmother uh, had a home, um, and that home had appreciated in value over her lifetime. So that the 
the small amount that she paid for it when she first bought it 40, 50 years earlier uh, versus what it was worth when she was ready to sell it was very different. Right? And that was because the real estate properties had increased. It was in a, uh, it was in a nice section of town, uh, and so that value continued to increase. So that when she died, the value of that home was passed on essentially to her children, to my mother, uh, who had the option to sell that home if she wanted to, to keep the home. And she could then uh, keep um, those proceeds. Now, that was my white grandmother who died a few years ago. And this is all going back to that very first that image about the continuation of, 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 of wealth. You see, because in my family, because my family has comes from a privileged background, um, right, the economic gains enjoyed by my grandparents were passed on to my father, who enjoys a very middle class, upper middle class lifestyle. When he dies, right, that money that he has saved, his home, his property, will eventually be passed on to me and, and, and be part of my and my siblings' net worth. Right? So it's easy for me to chart my family's net worth going, going back decades, centuries. And that is not true for people of color in our country who did not have those same opportunities. Right? Who were brought to this country, who were not able to buy their own, uh, own homes, Right, who were not able to build up properties to, to purchase homes, uh, people who did not have right uh, of, of law, right, whose property were frequently stolen, they could not go to judges and seek redress, uh, people whose property, whose land was often taken, um, whose lives were often taken. And as a result, over decades of these type of discriminatory policies, um, right, that continuation of net worth never continued. So I imagine if my grandmother had bought this home and my grandmother was African American, right, um, it was it would be less likely for her to have been able to buy that home in the first place. As a result, she would end up renting, and all that money month after month would be going to pay to the landlord. So what Tanasi Coates does is he goes through and he looks at one man. Um, his name is escaping me at the moment, but his story has stayed with me. All right, his name is Clyde Ross, born in 1923, the seventh of 13 children uh, who grew up in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And throughout his life, Clyde Ross reports that his family were constantly being discriminated against. His father had a property, but uh, the property was taken because the, uh, a judge said that he was behind in his taxes. He wasn't. Uh, when the people came to take his land, they took all of their possessions as well. And so at a very early age, Clyde Ross became homeless with his family, not because of anything that they had done wrong, but because they were black, and because in, in Mississippi, that was considered a crime. Right? All of those possessions, the horses, the property, were, were taken away. Clyde Ross started anew. Clyde Ross would go to World War II, he would come back, he would re resettle in Chicago. Uh, he would begin working for Campbell's Soup and make a decent middle class wage. He was married, he had a family. And in this era, though, of, of FHA discrimination, when Clyde Ross decides to go to, to the bank to get funding, he learned from his banker that the bank did not have money to lend. Now, that's not entirely true. The bank had plenty of money to lend. The bank didn't have money to lend to Clyde Ross because he was black. So because Clyde Ross could not get a, uh, a mortgage, a loan from the bank, Clyde Ross had to use an alternative method to get a, a home for his family. And that was he went through an intermediary. During, during the 1940s and 50s in Chicago, wealthy, white, entrepreneurs would often buy up homes. And they would then, instead of uh, use these homes as, as properties, they wouldn't necessarily rent them out, but they would act as uh, middlemen to African-American families. Because they could not receive, because these African-American families couldn't receive loans for themselves, these men would come in and say, we will give you, we will let you live in this house. You will pay a down payment, and every month you will make payments to us essentially a rent to own. Now there's a small difference though. 
when I bought my house from the bank, right, uh, the bank gave me money, the bank um, took the deed, and when I paid off my home, right, the property would belong outright to me. What happens in this case, though, is that Clyde Ross does not um, get the deed to his property. The deed is, is held by the man who owns it, and instead, Clyde Ross is renting it. According to their agreement, when Clyde Ross has paid off the, the full value of the home, then the owner of the house would give the deed to Clyde Ross. So essentially, he is renting, but the difference was Clyde Ross had all the responsibilities of home ownership, meaning that when the uh, furnace burned out, he was responsible to replace it. But he says, well, I don't have the deed to this house. It's not technically mine. The deed's in your name. You should be the one doing it. Right? But that is not the agreement that was set up. Clyde Ross had to make improvements to the home. He made payments on the home, but he would never have the deed to the home until it was fully paid off. Now, written into that language was the idea that if Clyde Ross ever missed a payment, he would automatically forfeit all of the money that he had already paid. So if he was in year 29 of this 30-year agreement and he missed a payment, everything that he had paid prior to that point would be forfeited. His down payment would be forfeited, the improvements that he made on the house would be forfeited, and he would be evicted from that property. Right? This is so completely unfair. It blows my mind how unfair this was. And this was common. Uh, the, the man that Clyde Ross bought his home for had hundreds of homes. And as soon as the family missed a payment, they would be evicted, and that same type of housing agreement would be created with a different African-American family. So basically, this is a rent-to-own plan in which the uh, tenant agrees to make all the improvements to the property, but there is no guarantee that they have any equity in that property. So, for Clyde Ross, had he saved that money that money wouldn't have been forfeited, would not be passed on to his children. So, when I go back and I look at this wealth gap, now I know reparations is, is a topic that is very controversial. We've seen recently some institutions begin making small steps towards reparations. For instance, Georgetown University, which was built by slaves, uh, just last year or the year before, agreed that any... Um, a descendant of the slaves that built the uh, that built uh, Georgetown University could have free admission to that school. Right, we're beginning to see steps made to uh, provide for reparations. Um, while that doesn't explain the full story, choice does play uh, a significant role here. We can't help but look at what the impact of American racist racial um, institu institutionalized policies have had on the current plight of African Americans in the United States today. All right, uh, that's it for this a little bit longer than normal lecture. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have the time or the interest, to go back and read ta Coates' argument in the case for reparations. It is amazing. Um, if you're interested in redlining, uh, I encourage you to search for that term, redlining, on Google. Uh, if you are into podcasts, I know that This American Life did a fantastic two-part series on redlining a few years ago that you could watch and listen to. Uh, or another fascinating podcast that talks about this topic is 99% uh, Invisible, uh, which last year did a special on redlining. Uh, I would encourage you to seek this out. Become informed about it. Uh, redlining was common. It took place in just about every major city in the United States, uh, and, I'm, and I've been able to research and see that it was done both in Harrisburg and more locally in New York. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about those topics, I encourage you to look that up. All right, uh, that's it for today. Thank you, guys.